accompanying him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome to worship this first Sunday of Lent. If you attended our intergenerational Sunday school gathering this morning, you would know that unlike today's lesson that Sarah just read, the book of Mark offers us just two verses on the temptation of Jesus. The text from Luke, however, is a bit longer and it offers us more detail. One theory is for the scripture being different in this way is that there was a Q source, they call, which is uh, meaning a source that was not included of the books that were uh, gathered to create the Bible. Or perhaps there were other writings that gave more insight, is what sometimes theologians say. Other arguments say that the, the, this was all oral testimony at the time, and that's why it varies as who uh, wrote the story, as did this uh, version of Luke. What's important to remember, however, is that the interpretation of each evangelist is carefully recorded to offer the truth in some greater detail than others. So historically in the Bible, the wilderness was a place where God met with Jewish people at Sinai after rescuing them from Egypt. It was in the wilderness that God shaped his covenant, his promise for his people as to what would happen if they followed him. So it is fitting that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tested to confirm God's covenant to be true. For today's cast of characters, we have Jesus and Satan. In Luke's gospel, this is the first mention of the devil. He'll be back. From what we can see in today's narration, he is bold, clever, and powerful. As we pick up at the end of Jesus' time in the wilderness, he has been there for 40 days. The scripture tells us that Jesus had eaten nothing and he was famished. Not famished in the sense of you come home for supper and you smell something yummy cooking in the kitchen and say, ooh, what's for supper? I'm famished. Not that. It, it, this type of uh, famish translation means that this hunger means an extreme need for food, a sense of physical weakness brought on by hunger. So Jesus was weak, right, when the temptation occurred. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus quickly answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him an instant picture of the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given to me, and I will give it to anyone that I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written. Important. If you, are, uh, you like to write in your Bible or you highlight, it is written. Title of my sermon, it's important. It is written. He said, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on a pinnacle of the temple, saying, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down there. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is said, Do not put your Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until another opportune time. The discourse, this, this discourse between Jesus and the devil reveals some interesting things to consider. First, 
the devil is bringing out all the stops, isn't he? I mean, he offers Jesus all these sins, sin of self-indulgence, you know, make, make some bread out of stone. He offers the sin of glorification, amplification. The whole world is yours if you worship me. And finally, he offers sin cloaked in scripture. It is written. Yes, the devil quoted from Isaiah. Let that sink in. Seeing the devil quote from the Bible should not be overlooked. How many of you have heard someone quote scripture in order to fulfill a desired response or to tailor a situation that suits their needs? Using scripture to benefit one's narrative is a misuse of the interpretation of the Bible. Interpreting scripture is called hermeneutics. Let's say it together. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. It's kind of a tongue twister, isn't it? But it's a good tongue twister to remind us that scripture should not be interpreted to do Satan's work. Hermeneutics, interpretation of the scripture. We can all memorize and recite scripture. Even the devil can memorize and recite scripture, as the text showed us here. It is when we use it to serve ourselves, we are playing right into Satan's playbook. So be careful. Hermeneutics. When you read the scripture, when you quote the scripture, look not just at the face of it, but allow yourself to thoughtfully investigate the context, the intended narrative, and ask yourself some good questions. Good questions. Why was the temptation of Jesus in the Bible? Why did Jesus follow the Holy Spirit to a desolate place and submit himself to extreme hunger and temptation? After all, he's the son of God. Why are we being shown a story where Satan uses God's words against Jesus, the human form of God? Would that be using God's words against himself? Ask good questions. How did Jesus respond? What was the response of Satan? Where'd he go? Out of here, right? He left. Who is understanding then how to handle Satan? We are, by listening and reading the scripture. We know Christ was a human transformation of God on earth who came and walked among us to share the human experience. We also know that the temptation is something that is part of our lives, right? We can all identify with temptation. Therefore, by seeing how Jesus handled this encounter with temptation, we are offered an example to identify when extreme pressure of sin smacks us cold in the face. By refusing the temptation of the devil, Jesus reminded the faithful of his baptismal vocation as the Son of God. He remained obedient to the word of God. Friends, from birth to death, we will be tested in our faith. You can be as happy as a lark right now in this sanctuary and to watch our new members be received and, and it's a beautiful sunny day and you can go outside and something might befall you this afternoon. You might find out that you're related to someone who was struck by a tornado and lost their home and have nothing this morning. You might have... Uh, something in your life that you weren't expecting. That's what life is. We're tested in our faith. We experience times of trial and times of life when it seems unfair and, and almost ugly, even cruel. In these situations, where would we turn if we didn't have God? We could, as the devil would prefer, try to rely on our own resources. The old, I got myself into this mess, and I'm sure going to get myself out of it. And it might work for you for a while, but eventually you'll self-destruct. It won't work. Trying to solve our problems without God's guidance is a fool's errand. God offers us grace and guidance when we tell him, Lord, I can't do this on my own. That's all you got to say. When we are tested, there is comfort knowing that he has not abandoned us, even when we're in the wilderness, in the thick of things, in the thick of that which befalls our life. 
If you were to take away one lesson from today, I would ask that you know this, that God remains faithful even when we fail. God remains faithful even when we fail. God remains faithful. Romans 3, 3 through 4 says, what if some are unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human be a liar. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he is faithful. If we are faithless, he is faithful. After hearing the lesson of the temptation of Jesus, ask yourselves, what's God's message for the faithful? He's not going anywhere. In the wilderness, when Satan attempted to persuade, to coax, to mislead Jesus, God was there to support, to give strength, and to offer a way out through his grace and the truth of his word. It was his word that Jesus could rely on. We call this truth in Christianity righteousness. Sometimes you'll hear the old verses and they talk about righteousness. It means truth, the truth of the scripture of God. The message of the temptation of Jesus Christ is a gift for us all. It teaches us faithful obedience to God and how we must have consistent reliance on the word of God. I was having a really interesting conversation this morning with Lowell Comstock after Sunday school, and he was ta- we were talking about uh, repentance and, and God's grace. And I said to him, I said, right, but we must be consistent and we must rely on the word of God and be faithful. We must learn, as Jesus did in the wilderness, to follow the word of God despite the allure of Satan's temptations because they're always around us. If we have one message for our new members here this morning that are going to be joining shortly, I would say that you need to remember that you are equipped with the word of God and you can trust in him to lead you and to lift you up and to support you. You have the power to tell Satan, you cannot undermine me. Get behind me, Satan. You can say, I have the knowledge of God on my side. I have a life that was given to me by Jesus Christ who paid the ultimate price for my sins. I have the Holy Spirit who lives within me and gives me the strength to tell Satan to back off. Today I pray that this time of Lent will open your eyes to the message of Jesus Christ and the power that we are given when you come to know him. Those who are led into the wilderness know this, that they can rely on God, they can trust in him, and they can give thanks for the righteousness of his word. I want to close my message this morning with Paul's words to the Ephesians, found in chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Amen.